Okay, are you captivated? <laughs> if so, I can go home. No. Um, well, obviously, uh, aquarium fish keeping, um, I don't know if it's fine. We'll be going into some of the history of the, of the hobby, but uh, it's been around for quite some time. And um, I want to share with you a case study of where um, I find a source of great hope and great encouragement when we're so concerned about the environment, when we're losing the environment so fast. I want to share something with you that, that I find very encouraging. Um, this is a, a, an old photo of, of some cardinal tetras in, in captivity. Um, and I, I want to share with you some of the uh, details about this particular case study of the cardinal tetra fishery in Brazil's Rio Negro and some implications as to a model that we might uh, build on. So um, there's the fish, obviously a, a beautiful, breathtaking fish, very popular worldwide. And um, it was only recently they, that they started becoming um, produced in captivity, relatively recently. Um, for generations, they've been coming from Brazil's Rio Negro. And at times, as many as 40 million individual fish a year get captured and exported. When I first saw that, I was shocked. I was taken aback. And I felt, we need to stop this. We need to stop taking these animals from the wild. They should be farmed. Um, that was in 1991. And it turned out that I was very wrong. I was, I was, I was wrong <laughs> in many ways. The natural history of the species allows for this very high volume um, capture. Every year, the Rio Negro goes through a severe drought, a low water season, when um, the populations of this fish plummet and enough survive the uh, low water season to uh, repopulate the next year uh, when, the, when the forest floods again. And the, the capture of these fish represents very little threat um, to the long-term stability of the, of the fish population, apparently. It's a very, it takes place over a very large area. It's difficult to have um, good metrics for this fishery, but it's been going on for, for quite some time. So again, it started um, in, in a higher volume in the, the 1950s after World War II when planes started going to remote places and the fishery resource was there and the connections were made to the global market. This is a typical fishing camp uh, when, the f when the flood starts to recede and some of the land gets exposed again. The fish, con the fish populations are very, very concentrated, but the niche is constricting. Um, it's a very bad outlook for many of those fish um, because they're going to go into the low water season with very little places to hide, very little food, lots of predators. Um, and so uh, when the fish are concentrated, that's when the, the fishing takes place. Very simple uh, material and, and equipment is used for capturing the fish. That's a, a large net that they wield. They actually herd the fish into the net. It's a little bit of a cumbersome net. And that's all a rural Amazonian needs to be employed to have a, a livelihood. A canoe, a net, a, a basket lined with plastic, and connections to the, the global market. And then they have a livelihood. They're very connected with the environment. Uh, I, was, I was very impressed with this technique. Um, they can actually call the fish out of the forest. And uh, the fishing residents, uh, it's, it is just amazes me, uh, their familiarity with their environment. It just, it's just overwhelming. Not always the easiest place to work. And so it's limited to these small dugout canoes, which um, kind of limits their their catch per day. They can't take a big barge in there. They, they hunt the fish by eye. There they are um, looking for a school of cardinal tetras and chasing them into the net. So there's very little bycatch. It's a very selective fishery. And there's a, a, a top view of some cardinal tetras. Even though the Rio Negro is very dark, the fish are just brilliantly colored and, and they stand out very well. Um, there are many women oops, involved in the fishery. Uh, there are no barriers. Um, and women get the, paid the same as men uh, for their fish. Um, again, in the foreground, you can see uh, that fisher's carrying capacity. Um, it's just that plastic lined basket and they can maybe take a couple thousand fish. If they do catch some non-target species, they're released in the same place where they were captured. Fishes are held for a short time at the, in front of the fishers' camps in these uh, pens or, or hapas. Um, <clears throat> whole families are involved in the, in the industry, sorting the fish, sizing them, um, organizing them by species. 
they get brought into the town of Barcelos, which is about 450 kilometers up the Rio Negro from the international port of Manaus. There they uh, are temporarily held at a floating transfer station. Um, and there are no roads that go to Barcelos. There's a small airstrip, but really the main connection to the outside world is the Rio Negro itself. There are some freight boats that go up and down the river carrying everything, uh, cars, cows, and aquarium fish. This, I think I actually took these pictures, they look a little bit grainy. I think I took these in 1991. That was my first visit to Barcelos. And it, it was at this time that I was having that reaction. This is too much. This needs to be stopped. This needs to be shifted to farming. And um, had I been able to snap my fingers and make that happen, it would have been um, devastating on the, on the region. What I, what I didn't understand was the natural history of the, of the species and um, how robust and resilient the fish are. What I really didn't see also was um, the economic importance of the fishery to the residents. Um, it's not easy to find uh, a livelihood in the tropical forest. You can't go work at Ikea or something, but you need to do something to feed your family. Those of us, we, we all, most of us have children, and we know that we would do anything to feed our children. If we didn't know how we were going to feed our children tomorrow and the days after, it would be a very desperate situation. And environmental impact of decisions would be irrelevant. It would, be, it would, it would mean nothing. Again, you can see on the lower deck, all of those tubs have about uh, 800 to 1,000 cardinal tetras, and that's one boat on one day. So you can understand this reaction that I had at first. This is at an export facility uh, in Manaus. I want to come back to this particular facility in a little bit in the talk. But you can see each of those pools holds about 10,000 fish, and uh, they spend at least 30 days there before export. There are styrofoam boxes of fish being prepared for shipment out. This is at an import facility. This is in Miami. And this is at a pet shop. This is in, um, in Scotland. So I wanted to share with you this journey of the fish from the, from the forest and from the fishing communities to, to these aquariums. And I wanted to share with you that first reaction that I had, that this was too much and it's bad, to doing a 180 degree turn and realizing that not only is it not bad, but it's absolutely essential. If, again, if I were able to snap my fingers and shift that fishery to farm fish, um, the result would first be a, a socioeconomic catastrophe for the region and then likely an environmental catastrophe. Even though these fish are so resilient and so robust, they're very sensitive to environmental conditions. If the environment, if the floodplain is damaged, that's going to affect water quality and that's going to close this life cycle of cardinal tetras. So the residents, they know how important the cardinal tetra is. The cardinal tetra represents about 85% of the export. There are many other species that are, that are exported, but it's really all based on this fish. Um, the, the other 15% um, is mostly other characins, but also stingrays, cichlids, uh, catfish. Um, but by them keeping their eyes on environmental conditions that are geared towards the ro most robust fishery, then the whole ecosystem is protected. These fishing communities, it isn't their objective to protect pink river dolphins or macaws or anacondas or monkeys, but all of those species, a lot of critically endangered and IUCN red listed species benefit by the protection of the fishing communities because they're connected to the environment because of these captivating fishes. So I'm embarrassed that it actually took me several years to metabolize this whole thing and, and, and realize what was going on right in front of my face. But um, I've since become the proponent of this fishery. We had a brief period of discovery. Many, for, for centuries, people have been going to the Amazon to discover cities of gold or tribes of, of, of Amazon women. I feel very excited that a, a discovery has been made here that people can live in areas of biological importance and it can be mutually beneficial. And I love fish, so I'm very, very lucky to have uh, stumbled across this. So environmentally beneficial, socioeconomically important, it alleviates poverty and, and it's a driver of environmental stewardship. And I wanna go into a, a little bit of a fun part. Um, 
Um, Brazilians have a very rich culture um, and just, just fantastic texture to this culture. And the fish are so important to them that every year they have um, a festival to celebrate the fish. And I want to share that with you now. Before I go into it, I, want, I don't want to talk too much over the video. Some of you folks have seen this before. Um, they actually celebrate the fishery. And they've built a stadium to host this party. And it's competitive. There are two sides. There's a cardinal tetra side and a discus side. I'm sure many of you know that discus are also very important. They actually fly in judges to judge uh, this, this pageant. And they judge them on music and dancing costumes. Um, and you'll see in the stadium that one side of the stadium will be just electric, supporting their team. The other side will be there, but they'll be sitting quietly. The, the uh, audience actually gets judged. While your side is performing, you have to show the most support. While the opposition is performing, you must sit and you must be respectful. So we've also found uh, civility in arena sports in this tiny town in the jungle. But let me, let me share this with you because I don't want to run out of time. Oh, come on. Here we go. Oh, no. Let me figure this out. Oh, no. Oh, fiasco. <laughs> Sorry. It's the virus. Please. Oh, I was offered the chance to test it, and I said no. And it'll be fine. Is anybody smarter than me here? No, I'm sure there are. It, sh it should go on a mouse click on the slide. Okay. This is worth the wait. You'll enjoy it. You might feel compelled to dance. Oh, is there sound? Oh, no. I'm not prepared. I'm so sorry. Okay, perhaps I'll sing. Maybe not. My, my throat is too bad today. Otherwise, okay. I think it would still be worth uh, looking at. So there um, is the... Oh. Okay, um, our project, Project Piaba, is the local word for minnows or small, small fish. The stadium is called the Piabodrom, the, the Piaba Dome. See this people sitting quietly in the back as the uh, opposition performs. But again, captivating fishes. I show this video a lot at um, hobbyist clubs, and I tell them this is the impact you have on this, this community that's... that's thousands of miles away and, and culturally even, even further away, that the, 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 the hobbyists and these Amazonians are connected via fish. This festival is, um, I know I said I wouldn't talk, but without the music, I, I, I might as well. Um, so this is the biggest thing of the year that happens. The, the population of the town of Barcelos is about 20,000. Um, in, the, in the greater municipality, there are an additional 20,000. There are the judges there. Serious, but a little head bopping. <laughs> so um, all year, the day after this festival, they'll start preparing for next year. When I go, I usually bring a group of people, fish hobbyists, people in the industry, people um, from public aquariums. And we will be about the only gringos there. And this is created for them by them. This isn't really something to um, for foreigners. Actually, I think we have a little a little bit of subtitles coming up, so you'll be able to um, see some of the lyrics of the music. Oh. So 
So that was the end of the discus side. The cardinal side is preparing now. You can tell while walking through town if a person is a cardinal tetra or a discus just by um, the, the colors they wear. And they ask me a lot, What's, what side are you? And I'm afraid, it's, it's so politically charged. I say, I, I'm placostomous. I, I'm an ugly brown fish that chews on wood. And it, 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 it kind of defrays the situation. They usually don't announce the winners until a couple of days later. They let the blood cool down. They let everybody sort of go out to their, see the Cardinal Tetris? That's bad handling practices. That's quite stressful there. That, we'll talk about best handling practices in a little bit. That's okay. That's okay. It, it's almost over. Just let it go. The giant blackness is the Rio Negro, but you can't make this stuff up. Um, this is this has zero influence from outside other than the market connection. This is not something that was created in Washington D.C. or Geneva and implemented there. This is this is organic from their culture and their uh, their love and appreciation and captivation for fish. Yeah. I brought my uh, seven-year-old and my four-year-old last year, and they had a ball. It's just amazing. It's this little jungle town. You can count the amount of cars in town, and uh, they come up with all of this because of fish. Okay. Shall we have a vote? <laughs> That's okay. How am I doing on time? Not too bad. I want to leave some time for discussion, so I'm going to try to speed through. There we are. Oops. Are we still in PowerPoint? No. Sorry. Yes. Okay, we've discussed this. Oh, I think it's going on its own. Okay. All right, I think we're going to... Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, terrible. Okay. Um, so, the surprising outcomes of this, this exploitation of, uh, of the environment, of wildlife where it's a very powerful driver of environmental protection. It's, it alleviates poverty, it protects regions of biological importance and IUCN red-listed species. Um, I don't know how much carbon is in that tropical forest, but quite a bit, and how much CO2 that forest continues to sequester out of the atmosphere. But it's our interest in these little fish that has these, these outcomes. So um, that's... that's um, I'm so skipping ahead with the, the, the talk there. there. There are, however, some threats to this fishery. Uh, the dream I had in 1991 of the fish uh, they should be farmed, that has come true. And it's no longer my dream, but it's my nightmare. And, uh, and so now it's, it's ironic that the, one of the threats to these fish is farming them outside of the Amazon. If the market chooses to source its fish from these farms, if the Brazilians that have been uh, relying on this fishery for generations abruptly lose it, um, I don't know what they'll shift to. I've asked them, um, and timber harvest, uh, cattle ranching, gold mining, urban migration are often um, some of the responses of some alternatives if they can't sell fish anymore. So ironically, I've become this proponent of uh, this wildlife trade. So um, we have set up a, a subgroup within the IUCN, um, within the, the freshwater fish spe specialist group, the home aquarium fish subgroup, an awkward acronym, H-A-F-S-G. Um, but we're looking for other regions throughout the tropics where this model is currently going on, where people are connected to the environment via fish and where it's a driver of uh, environmental protection. So we're seeking to actually foster that. Um, we're trying to help the Brazilian cardinal tetra fishery adapt. Part of the reason why farm fish might be more attractive is the quality of the fish. The Rio Negro is very acidic 
and the handling methods for the fish are sometimes traumatic. They, they don't often result in acute death. So uh, if a fish is traumatized or stressed, they're, they're passed on and they're sold. But we need to minimize some of the trauma that goes on. Um, the export facilities need good food, good fish food, and it needs to be stored properly. So some simple things like this. The export facility that I showed you with uh, those blue pools going off into infinity, that closed. And that has had a knock-on effect on the fishing communities. And it's had a knock-on effect on the importers, making it even more frustrating to try to bring these beneficial fish out of Brazil. And if they can't get them out of Brazil, it just incentivizes farming them because it's such a beautiful and popular lucrative fish. So there's a bit of a crisis currently going on. Um, I have confidence though, we do have some things in the works. I don't think it's over yet by any means. And I do think we have the opportunity to, um, to find other models like this that are going on. The hobbyists um, love this idea, they love fish. Um, and if they have the opportunity to buy fish that helps the environment, um, then uh, the early indications are they'll be very receptive to that. So this is the chair of the freshwater fish specialist group in the IUCN. This is him maintaining his home aquarium. So um, he was very receptive to the idea as well. So uh, public aquariums, we have a great potential here for this. This is my institution, the New England Aquarium. We have 1.2 million visitors a year. In North America, we have um, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums where we have 180 million visitors a year. These are people that are drawn to fish by definition. They come to a public aquarium. So we have a fantastic opportunity here to showcase these case studies to our, to our visitors. Look at all of those fish-loving people. And our, our exhibits are very powerful and very compelling. And we can take this opportunity to deliver this messaging of if, if they're inclined to enter the fish hobby, they can seek fish that results in environmental benefit. This is an exhibit that we're preparing to open this spring and not a huge, gigantic walk through rainforest. We're gonna show aquarium fish in home aquariums. We want it to look as attainable as possible. We can use technology like QR codes or beacons where you can get the information on your, on your smartphone and have a store locator that will bring you to a store that's carrying some of these fish. If the manufacturers want, they can add a discount onto a starter kit to encourage our visitors to, uh, to enter the hobby. So again, we have 180 million visitors in North America. There are, conveniently for math, there are 18 million households that have aquariums in North America. That's a little bit, that's in decline a little bit. But if we inspire 1% of our visitors to enter the hobby because of this messaging, that's a 10% annual growth for that industry. So it makes it very, it's a very uh, strong attractant and, um, and they get rewarded for carrying environmentally beneficial fish. Again, working out some of the, the kinks, uh, we're working on best handling practices. We have aquatic veterinarians working with us to um, come up with methods that minimize stress and maximize the animal welfare. Oops, did I, oops, oh no. All right, that's gonna take a long time. Uh, the steering committee of our uh, home aquarium fish subgroup. We have um, representatives from zoos and aquariums, uh, the FAO, the World Bank, and uh, a lot of people that have interest in seeking to, um, to foster this, um, uh, this facet of fish keeping. Okay, I'm gonna end here. Um, not so bad for time. We can discuss it if you. Hmm? Okay, wow. I can't believe it. Okay, any questions? Yes. Do you feel that it's generally preferable for uh, fishes in the aquarium trade to be wild caught rather than farmed, or is it just this specific species? Um, that's a very important fit question. Um, if you look at the old models of K-selective and R-selective, you can identify species like caracens, danios, barbs, rasboras, rainbow fish, that I think are mostly niche dependent. And I don't think that the manual capture really represents much of a, a threat. But catfishes, cichlids, stingrays, you have to pay more attention. Um, there are some hybrid aquaculture models being looked at. For example, with marine reef fish, um, there's, there are new techniques being developed in public aquariums to capture eggs and larvae 
in some of our giant exhibits. And we're working out, we're simplifying the techniques to grow the, the early foods for these eggs and larvae. One of the applications we want is to apply this in situ to coral reefs and pro provide the opportunity for reef side communities to shift from capturing adult reef fish to collecting eggs and larvae and maintain that, that connectivity. There's a lot of effort also being made to captive breed reef fish because of these, some of these fisheries are, are really stressing the environment. I worry about that down the road. Is, is a bad fishery better than no fishery? It's a, it's a big question. If you have a bad fishery, maybe you can make it better. And if down the road we're successful in doing some capacity building for reefside residents to capture eggs and larvae, can you imagine what they'll think when they look at their reef? If non-resident roving people come to do destructive pra practices, they're going to feel connected that, that, to that reef. They're going to want a very robust and healthy. So wherever possible, I want to try to uh, maximize the connection of people to the environment via fish. But the Cardinal Tetra, is a, it, it, that's, that case uh, is very fortunate in that that species has that natural history. But with, there may be some adaptations we can make to that model to achieve the, that connection and that protectionism. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna go back to bed. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>